England should have won this game. Despite some issues in the first half, they absolutely should have won. It was um, a bit of a choke job, and Steve Borthwick, I don't think, is going to be very impressed. The French, on the other hand, after having a really bad start to the tournament, I think they are starting to get a bit of consistency, which is really good for them. My name is Max, and I'm going to be the host of today's video. I also want to say a massive thank you to my patrons. I'll follow this video up with a video of the Irish winning the Six Nations, but first... We've got to talk about one of the great tests, one of the best of 2024 so far. So guys, let's get into this. For about the first 15 minutes, the English and French tested each other out and began their scoring with penalty goals. Nolan Ligaric, though, lit Leon up with his opening try. While the try looks awfully simple, let's examine how this try was scored from such a deep position. Francois Cross takes the ball in 1849 to begin a counter-attack. Where most forwards in this situation would look to run it straight, gain more metres and set a ruck, or perhaps even dummy before a pass, Cross instantly recognises what needs to be done. He simply whips the ball away to Ramos who now has three teammates on his outside and Slade marking two of them at once. Because the ball reaches Fiku, Slade is now unable to tackle thanks to his side on position, creating a consecutive 2-on-1 for Freeman who was put in the same defensive situation as Slade, unable to commit to either carry option. Because Cross whips the ball away quickly rather than going for a dummy, England still have four possible tacklers, still behind Slade in the circle. Because Earl is one of the defenders attempting to cover, this leads to a third consecutive 2-on-1 as we now show Marcus Smith forced to follow two arrows as well. Now as we resume the motion, pay attention to the support line from Ligaric. He can see Daly leaving the backfield from out of frame, so continues to run. Because he stayed in support, a fourth 2-on-1 now happens. Francis tries a result of brilliant communication that's been built through TWI across the tournament. As this TWI is still a work in progress though, France score the rest of their first half points off Ramos's boot. Although England are down by 13 points by the 40th minute, we're going to highlight their response which is a brilliant set move by the looks of things. While it appears on 40.02 that England are attempting to continue their maul, I suspect that this is a dummy to create more space out wide. Olivon, Miafo, Aldred and Cross haven't even bothered to examine the outside channels on the open side, they're all looking at Alex Mitchell. But if we notice what's in front of Mitchell, we'll see that the mall is following an arrow that's pointing towards the post at the edge of the try line. They're likely trying to hold their weight to distract France with Underhill helping to sell the continuing mall. I'm now going to highlight another brilliant dummy by George Ford as we put the spotlight on him. After what was a woeful effort against the Irish, Ford ends a superb first half by wrapping around from the blind side to Slade's outside shoulder. Because Ford is in the boot, Slade has the option to either send Lawrence straight to the crash ball line or pop the ball out the back to Ford so that he can go long or chip kick. Because of this diamond shape, Fiku was forced to take his eyes off Lawrence and follow the two arrows, as we saw from many English defenders before Ligarek's try. Because Fiku's right shoulder has turned towards Ford, he's now left a weak body position for Lawrence's line, with Lawrence spotting the gap for his first half try. This brings us to the half-time stats following Lawrence's first try. The position and the territory stats, I don't think we can really read into too much because the kicking game wasn't really too existent from the French while England were kicking away a lot of possessions so I don't necessarily think these stats here we can read into too much. We can really see though um, a common thread I've discussed throughout the Six Nations has been England only really showing attacking capabilities off set moves from set piece. The French though running really good attack lines as we can see with their metres run, defenders beating clean breaks, passes, offloads and even turnovers one that are allowing them to get a little bit more of that position because their kicking game quite quite frankly in the Six Nations hasn't been very good. The way that they've been so potent at the breakdown though is kind of compensating and papering over that crack I do believe. Um, the tackle success for England though, this was the biggest difference between the two teams um, in this first half and if not for France having a bad kicking game, they could definitely have been ahead by far more points. England at just 60%, their tackle ratio in that first half was just terrible, not good enough, and it's no wonder France were in the lead. Um, the goal kick success really good from both teams, while France just had that extra bit of edge at the breakdown once again with the Rux 1 stat. 
which is uh, even better as well considering they had more breakdowns when they were in possession in comparison to the English yet still won 100%. The set piece was pretty good for both teams as well, both of them only losing one set piece off their own feed. For England it was a lineup for France, it was a scrum and if my count's correct, I do think two of the three French penalties were from the scrum. They were having a bit of a bad habit of um, trying to shove in the scrum a little bit too early. So, you know, I do believe that the French discipline in the scrum was definitely giving England a lot more of a say in the scoreline than they otherwise would have. Two of those errors from the French, obviously the scrum and the kicking game, were definitely allowing England to stay much more in the game than they should have been. However, England starting to get a bit of a comeback going. They had a very, very good second half, so let's not waste any more time. Let's get into explaining how England had a great second half. Although England had these defensive problems in the first half, the comeback continues as Lawrence gets a second try from close range. Wanting to make a statement and triple down, England's take on a shape very reminiscent of what we've recently seen from Wales and Ireland over the last few years. Much like an iconic Gareth Davis try from the 2023 World Cup that I of course can't show, England follow their line out with a shape that is options galore. The first option for forward is obviously the hands down the line, following the blue axis, while Genge sits in as the second receiver with Underhill in the boot. Because Genge is the second receiver, the next option of the shape sells him as a realistic carry option at the head of a pod, with Earl as both the outside clean out option and also the third receiver in the hands down the line axis. We'll now play an animation of the third attacking option in this shape. This shows the capability of Daly and Slage to wrap around towards Smith's outside, which would shift Lawrence further towards the edge and force BLBRD to mark three different attackers. Because this attacking shape is so complex, it puts doubt in the mind of Deportier in just his second test cap. After failing to commit to Earl due to the danger out wide, he misses this tackle as we can now see in slow motion. Smith, having been on Earl's outside this whole time, spots the opportunity to make me edit more Arrow animations with yet another 2 on 1, allowing a try to be scored in this match. I've mentioned it so many times, and probably more in this video as well. England's attack during open play, it does remain a work on, while France. They are incredibly good at adapting their game plan to what's in front of them. Anyone that's got a slight grasp on modern rugby can see what France are likely planning on 55-12. It's clear to me that Flamand and Taufi Fanua want to follow these animations and play as decoy runners to relieve pressure and let Ramos select a carrier. Lawrence, however, isn't a 12, he's a 13. His defensive instincts are to shut down threats out wide, leaving this red cross to highlight a gap between himself and Atoje. Although Peno and Ligarek take a while to decide who actually takes the pass, since Flamont runs after all, the wide shot presents to us the bigger picture, as France intended after all. Because Flamont has sucked three players into this big circle here, Tommy Freeman is now stuck marking both Olivon and Ramos, while Smith is stuck here marking both Barre and Deportere. Great offload from Olivon seals the deal with France scoring again. What I'm simply not doing though is spoiling this absolute beauty with analysis. I'll simply point out that France expertly capitalise off England's misthrow and line out with Fiku doing brilliantly to score. England, however guys, they are not out of this contest. They are here to play, they're showing mental strength, and as I've said, you know, attack and open play, it is a work on, but you know, I'm going to give it to you guys straight. I think the English are heading in the right direction. Take a notice here at Tommy Freeman making the stock standard carry in midfield. It might not seem like much, but as we now check out Kier's pass to Ford at the next phase, we notice the slight wee player appearance at the edge of frame. As Ford's pass reaches Smith, the camera tilts down to show us a brilliant wraparound line from Freeman. Because of the midfield carry we now rewinds to, it allows his wraparounds that will now animate to go undetected by the French defence. This now means that suddenly we have another overlap as Freeman finally gets his first test try nearly two years after his debut. Such a brilliant try for Freeman simply means England should have won this test match. But despite the strong discipline in the first half, England couldn't hold their discipline where it counted. An off the ball tackle by Joe Marler now allows Ramos 
to kick the winning goal of the game. And the final score, everybody, France 33, England 31. We can see a lot more of the kicking game becoming much more apparent for the French as well as it started to get better in that second half. They were able to apply more pressure and get a better share of that possession. That was working very well, but England held their own. They were able to play inside the French half a fair bit. That's because of um, their ruck presence and their defence improving. France weren't able to gain necessarily as many metres per carry during this second half. We can also see England's metres run start to creep up a little bit because their attack structure, like I said, I do think it's absolutely improving. We can see though with the offload stats that the French have played together for a much longer period of time, leading to more combined team cohesion and more trust in each other. It's allowing that communication to get the offloads flowing. The turnovers one as well, that was another big reason for England starting to get back into this test match. Because they were winning more turnovers, they were able to get more access to the front football, opening those opportunities to attack in open play. That was a major factor for them. Their tackle percentage as well, it improved significantly up from 60% to 74%. And as we know, more tackle accuracy equals fewer opportunities for the opposition. So while France were throwing offloads all over the place, they couldn't necessarily just break England open it as easily. So once again, another stat saying England probably should have won this test match. The set piece as well, excellent for both teams as per usual. France held a lot better in the scrum during that second half, but ultimately England's discipline count was double that of the French. France conceded 5 penalties in this test match, and the English conceded 10 penalties in the test match. Now guys, because of their share of penalties, they conceded a higher percentage of penalties inside their own half during the second half than they did in the first half. This really allowed Ramos to continue slotting those goals over and ultimately winning the game for the French off his boot. England definitely heading in the right direction, but ultimately their lack of discipline led to them choking again as it did against South Africa. England's do have some work to do on their mental toughness because here in New Zealand, when we play them in the mid-year tests, um, Eden Park isn't exactly the most welcoming environment for away teams as the All Blacks have not lost there since losing to the French in the 1990s. England, yes, positives to take away from them, but still a lot of work-ons, and same with the French, ultimately. These two teams will have figured out a few flaws about themselves, but also a few strength about themselves, sorry, that's going to help them very much down the track. I'll follow this video up with my video on how Ireland beat Scotland, and hopefully I'll also be able to get a team of the tournament in before the end of the week. Thank you so much for watching this video, guys. Really appreciate it, and another thank you to my patrons as well. It's been Matt's. I've loved the Six Nations. Cheers for watching, and I'll see you next time. Thank you.